Thank you, Michael. Well, Russ, you're up on screen. You're looking great uh, there in the Textron studio in Wichita. You got the great 10 behind you. Got uh, Carol Daniel on the uh, Daniels on the screen, and we're glad, Carol, your your house didn't burn down in the big fire. Uh, so we were all rooting for you there. So Russ, it's just great to have you here, and my great friend Ed Bolin is also also on the line here as my predecessor here at Gamma. So it's a great opportunity to celebrate our 50th anniversary. So I'm gonna I'm gonna launch right in, um, and I want to talk about those early years. Um, you know, Michael was talking about your academic lineage. I want to talk a little bit about your military lineage. You got a chance to fly that iconic F-86. And coming up on the screen here is a picture of that airplane. And uh, those of us that have had the opportunity to fly fighters have always looked at that airplane and gone, oh my gosh. But one of the things you did in your Air Force career is you went from the Air Force over then to the Marine Corps Reserve, and as an Air Force Air Force guy and a father of a, a Marine son, I go, whatever possessed you to even make that decision? How was it to fly that airplane? And uh, and can you talk about that military career? Uh, you 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 bet. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored to be here to celebrate the help celebrate the 50th anniversary of Gamma, which has played such uh, an essential role in the growth of the industry. Uh, I did indeed fly, uh, have the privilege of flying in the Air Force, and uh, after leaving the Air Force, went back to Harvard Law School and hoped to fly with the uh, Massachusetts Air Guard. <clears throat> they had just begun flying the uh, 86H, and they had a long line of applicants, uh, and so I was unable to join the uh, Air Force uh, unit, but a good friend of mine in law school was uh, flying with the Marine Air Corps Reserves at South Weymouth, I uh, went down, uh, got an interview, uh, an inter-service uh, transfer. I earned my uh, naval aviator's wings, so I have uh, wings of silver, wings of gold. I'm carrier qualified, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to fly for the— uh, was in the same unit as uh, Ted Williams. Uh, he used to come out and kid us every now and then on uh, the weekends, but it was a treat to fly in both branches, and both could not have been more uh, professional. What are, what, uh, when did the aviation bug first bite you? Well, I was born and raised in Davenport, Iowa, and I think uh, at the age of about five, uh, my dad drove me out to northwest uh, Davenport. There was a grass strip called Cram Field, and a young guy named Herb Elliott, who built one of the great uh, aviation companies over uh, his lifetime and still one of the great uh, operations, uh, was a dealer for both Piper and uh, uh, Beach at the time, and uh, we uh, sat by the airport and watched, I think it was a Piper Cub flying around shooting uh, landings, and I said to myself, among uh, whatever else I do in my lifetime, I am definitely going to learn to fly. Well, it's sure fortunate for us that that, that bug bit you when it did. Well, I'm going to fast forward now into the 70s. And uh, coming up on the screen now is a picture of that first Gamma board meeting in 1970. Uh, you became chairman not too long after this. So, so a lot of those folks in that, that picture uh, you knew very well and worked with on the board. I think the next picture we have uh, of you, the first one that I could find, is in 76. And there's a very young Russ Meyer in that uh, front row there, and uh, but there were a lot of icons on those uh, initial initial gamma boards. In fact, the next picture here, I think uh, you're giving an award uh, over to Bill Piper. Uh, so, can Russ? Can you talk a little bit about those those icons of our industry on the on in that initial time? And that that was with you when you were with Grumman, and uh, just tell us about you know how this association started. Pete, I'm. I'm uh uh, delighted to talk about that because general aviation up to 1970 really didn't have much of an identity. NBAA was around, AOPA had been around, but there was not really a focus for general aviation. And uh, some of the pioneers like Dwayne Wallace, uh, uh, Frank Hedrick, Bill Piper, and others, uh, general aviation had been part of AIA called the uh, Utility Aircraft Council which was not a really major initiative, so the uh, leaders of our industry felt that it was important to uh, form their own organization, uh, General Aviation Manufacturers Association. Dwayne came to Cleveland to see me in uh, 1969 and asked us to join. 
we were uh, developing a, a line of small propeller airplane uh, at that time, and uh, much as we wanted to join, we we found that five thousand dollar membership be a little high that first year. When we uh, acquired the Gulfstream program in 1971, I joined uh, quickly. Uh, attended my first meeting in uh, Scottsdale in February of uh, 1971. I think it's important to note that on that original sl slide with the original board, there's a tall, slender guy with horn rim glasses up on the uh, left side. It was Ed Stimson uh, with great vision. He was our, uh, of the board, he, he was the first president. There's also a picture of Stan Green, who might have been our longest time uh, employee. Uh, uh, Dwayne was the first chairman in 1970 and continued to uh, November of 71 when Jack Ferris, who was president of Lycoming, became chairman. Bill Piper was scheduled to be chairman the next year, but uh, Piper had been uh, acquired in a sort of an unfriendly takeover by Bangor Punta, and Bill was no longer involved with the company. So Lou Young became the third chairman. Uh, uh, 1972, and at the board meeting in November of 1973, I had the great honor of being elected uh, chairman. And that was chairman for the first time of three, and, and no one else has even been chairman twice. Uh, Clay Jones, who said to say hi, uh, he actually served for a year and a half, but uh, no one has, has had even more than two, and, and you are chairman three times. It's just phenomenal. Um, when you and I were talking, one of the, one of the things that uh, – that Michael pointed out is you, you worked with a lot of presidents. And uh, back in the Nixon administration, if we remember our history, the Yom Kippur War happens. Uh, Nixon did a big airlift to bail the Israeli military out because they were getting their butts kicked. And uh, people, historians say, we came closer to a nuclear war with the Russians at that time than we even did during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then there was an oil embargo afterwards. And it looked like all indications were that general aviation was going to take a huge hit with fuel availability. And that's uh, when I understand you went to work and really Gamma became known as uh, an organization that could actually affect change. Can you talk about that that threat during the oil embargo when President Nixon was in office? Yeah, the, t the timing was, uh, was interesting. I was elected uh, chairman on a uh, Saturday in uh, November, I believe. In Arizona, flew back to uh, Cleveland on uh, Sunday, which was where we were still headquartered. I got a call from Ed Stimson saying uh, Nixon was going to be making an address to the uh, country that evening, and we weren't going to like it very much, and we didn't because he went on national TV and announced a series of fuel restrictions uh, on av aviation fuel, and we were going to uh, be subject to that restriction to the uh, level of 50%. And uh, so I jumped on an airplane on Monday morning, uh, flew to uh, uh, Washington. Ed and I hosted a press conference in which we said this is no longer a question of growth. It's really a question of survival. And we uh, organized. We learned the value of working together. We worked with NBAA and AOPA. We did have a huge uh, asset at that time. Bob Dole had just been elected uh, 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 U.S. Senator from Kansas in 1968. He became very close to uh, Richard Nixon. I think Bob was national, uh, was chairman of the National Republican Party in 1972. So uh, our first visit, Ed and I uh, uh, went to visit with Bob and with others on the Hill and described to them that our primary uh, activity in general aviation was not, uh, uh, was, was uh, totally or essentially business related and we should be treated the same way other businesses were treated. Uh, we spent lots of time on the uh, Hill, and uh, within a relatively short period of time, uh, uh, the next administration agreed that we should uh, be subject to the same restrictions as other businesses, which was uh, 20%. So in retrospect, it was a relatively, uh, uh, it, was a, it certainly seemed serious at the time, but I think the most impressive part of that uh, issue was that Gamma became uh, I think not only highly respected on the Hill with the people we, I don't know, I, I never met a better human being than uh, Ed Stimson. Uh, uh, even though we were small, he, uh, he was well known, had great uh, uh, respect on the Hill, and we really found that by working together and, uh, and uh, being candid and honest, uh, 
uh, we can do things on the Hill. Well, uh, as we bring up the next picture, in that, that next administration, we had another challenge. Uh, and there's a picture of you in, the, in uh, President Ford's office. And uh, you guys are working with President Ford to talk about the importance of exports and trying to go and expand the, the global reach of this industry. Can you talk about uh, that meeting and, and what you did at that time with yet another president? Uh, 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 you bet, Pete. We, we were back in those days in the 70s, even into some, uh, to some extent in the 80s, some of the uh, countries in the world who were uh, uh, trying to get into the aviation business, in fact, who were in it, like uh, uh, France primarily, Brazil would be another one, uh, had implemented uh, fairly restrictive import requirements and uh, taxes for us to sell uh, aircraft in their country, and uh, we, of course, had not, no such uh, restrictions in this country. And uh, we found the uh, administration uh, very supportive uh, of, an uh, of an effort to really make the world uh, uh, the same for everyone in terms of the import, not only the taxes, but the restrictions. And uh, while it was not something that went away uh, uh, immediately, it uh, uh, we improved that environment very quickly, and of course today our uh, our business worldwide is almost 50 percent uh, of what it is in this country, and even back in those days the international market represented about 30 to 40 percent. So it was another uh, important initiative that we dealt with uh, candidly, and uh, and we were very successful. Oh, that's so important that that level playing field, so all of us can compete fairly is is great and thank you for your work on that one. Um, if we go to the next slide, one of the things that that you initiated that that uh, that I think is is just absolutely phenomenal is looking at uh, building student starts into this industry. And the slide that we have up now just shows piston aircraft deliveries through time. Now this is just piston aircraft deliveries, but uh, we've highlighted 1978 as be this industry delivered almost 17,000 pistons in 78. I mean, that's just a phenomenal number. And as I had looked at the history of Gamma, I had always thought that, well, maybe that spike was because <coughs> World War II aviators now in 1978, they're starting to become in their 50s now that they have disposable income. They started buying airplanes because they want to get back to flying. But in talking to you, you educated me that that's really not what it was, and it was actually a program that you and Ed Stimson put together to be able to go and, and get some student starts. And I think the numbers are phenomenal. Can you talk about uh, that program and, and how you named it and what the goals were? Well, I, I, I could talk about this for a long time, which I uh, promise I won't do. This, this is really a fun effort. You have, have to think back now, the 1960s and 70s, General aviation was primarily a propeller aircraft industry. Uh, we hadn't even flown the Citation prototype in 1970. The Gulfstream II was just uh, certified in 1968. So we were primarily a uh, propeller aircraft industry. Cessna, Beach, Piper were the leaders. And uh, back in the 60s, as you can see, we had deliveries up to the 12,000 level. I think in 1969, they slipped a little bit for a while in uh, the early 70s. And we relied very much on new student starts uh, to sell uh, smaller two and four place airplanes. And typically they would run 100 to 150,000 new student starts a year and, and maybe 50 or 60 percent of those who started completed uh, the program. So uh, we created a program, uh, 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 a lot of fun, we called it Takeoff. Uh, not just because Takeoff was reflective of the industry, but it had seven letters. And we had an 800 number, 1-800 takeoff. We hired a young gal who graduated from the University of North Dakota program named Karen Coyle, who not only a skilled pilot, but an eloquent speaker. She got on Good Morning America, Good Morning America and USA Today and, and spoke about uh, the excitement and the, uh, uh, how meaningful the industry was and our goal in 1977 and 78 was to create 300,000 new student starts, which we knew would enhance the growth of the industry. And amazingly, we did that in 77 and 78. And uh, the numbers that I remember, Pete, were not just the 
17,000 uh, propeller deliveries, but in both 1977 and 78, the industry delivered over 18,000 airplanes when you include the turboprops and the jets. We were very, very proud at uh, Cessna to deliver 9,600 of those airplanes uh, both years. And when I tell people uh, today that we were building 35 airplanes a day at Cessna, we were routinely delivering seven or 800 a month. Uh, uh, they look at me with a strange look. Uh, in fact, in October of 1978, we delivered 1,400 airplanes in one month at Cessna from a little delivery center uh, where we had about four or five people. So takeoff was fun. It was meaningful. Uh, we actually kind of recreated again in, uh, in the early 2000s when we were once again trying to enhance uh, the, uh, the, the lower and the uh, uh, single engine the piston market so uh, fun and meaningful boy when you talk about those delivery numbers oh we could only wish and then uh, hopefully with advanced air mobility we'll get get there again but then 300,000 student starts that that number just boggles my mind and you met that goal that's that's just amazing that yeah, was fun well Another very special program that, that I know is, is meaningful for a lot of us is the Citation Special Olympics. And if you bring up the next slide, um, you know, that, uh, in fact, this was for, from a later one. You can see our good friend Roger White, and I want to let you know Roger's on the line uh, this morning. And uh, Roger, good to have you with us. Um, and it, it meant a lot to me. If you go to the next slide, uh, you know, I had a chance uh, after my son was wounded in Iraq, you swapped stories uh, as a Marine, but I got a chance to participate in three of them. And uh, this, was, this was your brainchild, and it, it just grew and grew. And I remember walking into the Ops Center, if you roll the next pictures, Christine, that, that you, you go into the Ops Center and you'd see airplanes coming in from all over the country being tracked in, but you're out on the ramp. You, gre you greeted every single pilot, both coming in and leaving, and every single uh, Olympian coming in there. And it was just seeing you in action on the ramp just, just made me so happy for such an amazing cause. But my understanding is it wasn't, it, it initially was kind of tough to get going, and, and you had to sell it. Uh, the Shriver family, and of course Eunice uh, Kennedy there uh, as a big player in that, and then the Special Olympics Committee in that. It took some work to, to get this going. Can you talk about this, this amazing pro program? Uh, I, I, I'd uh, love it. Uh, I'd never met uh, Sarge Shriver. Uh, but he called me in, I think, December of 1985. They also had a, a Winter Olympics, uh, much smaller. But he asked if we would consider flying the Kansas Special Olympians to, I think it was Salt Lake City, to the Winter Olympics. And there were like 14 young people. And we said we'd be glad to do that, which we did uh, very quietly. And uh, so we at least uh, got acquainted with Sarge. And he said sometime when you're in Washington, stop by and... Uh, say hello. Well, we were awarded the, uh, as you mentioned earlier on, the Collier Trophy in, uh, in uh, uh, spring of 1986. And I went to Washington, called uh, Sarge and asked to stop by and say hello. And not only did we get acquainted, but he told me the 87 International Special Olympics were going to be held in South Bend and how tough that it was to get. They had four or 5,000 Special Olympians coming to South Bend. They were going to stay at Notre Dame. And uh, would we, uh, could we possibly help uh, with some of that transportation? And we, uh, we thought about it a lot. And at, a, at the uh, Collier Trophy, we wanted to describe what a useful and, uh, and uh, flexible and efficient uh, mode of transportation we had in the industry. So I committed to uh, Sarge and Eunice. In fact, they came to the uh, 1986 Collier Trophy Award uh, dinner, and we had a, a table full of Special Olympians, and we announced that in 1987, the next year, we were going to fly at least a thousand uh, Special Olympics from uh, small uh, uh, towns around the country uh, to and from South Bend, and everybody just loved it. And I got back to Wichita, and I had a wonderful assistant named Marilyn Richwine who eventually became uh, head of that whole program, and she said, I think that's a wonderful idea. How are we going to do it? And I said, well, first of all, you're in charge, and uh, uh, Marilyn and I and uh, Dean Humphrey and Bob Pfizer, who was then our uh, head of uh, flight operations, uh, 
uh, talk to a lot of our customers and uh, to make a long story short in uh, uh, July of 1987 on the west side of the South Bend Airport we had a little archway of roses we had 130 citations uh, deliver everybody on a Friday and eight days later they picked them up on a Saturday morning uh, everything could not have gone better and when you think about that 260 uh, takeoffs and landings over uh, a period of about eight hours. We had a takeoff and a landing about every minute and a half. Never had anyone ill, never lost a baggage. Uh, uh, we got a lot less help uh, when they departed than when they arrived, but it was so successful. We had one every year. Uh, and most recent one, I think, uh, was 2007 in Des Moines. Uh, we had 340 airplanes involved in Des Moines, and we, uh, we flew almost uh, uh, 3,000 uh, Special Olymp uh, Olympians to and from the program. So we got great help from uh, you were there. Ed Stimson was always there. Dick Koenig was there. We had sort of a cult of people who uh, loved to come, and uh, we could not have been more pleased by the cooperation that we got from our uh, citation owners. And and I know that a lot of the members of this board flew their their aircraft in on the airlift, and Har Harrison did that, and and uh, I mean just the folks that you could gather together, uh, hats off. That was that is such a, a meaningful event, and and I I loved every second of it. Well, Thank well, you. let's get back to the political front. Now now we got a different president and a different decade, and uh, now we're in the 1990s and. Uh, if you call up the picture, the previous one there, Christine, um, uh, you had uh, been with uh, President Clinton, uh, and there was a commission that was established, and the commission was uh, to ensure a strong and competitive U.S. airline industry. Uh, you got named to that commission, and uh, not only did you start working to help help uh, the airlines and how general aviation interacts with the airlines, but you started to spread the seeds for uh, a next very important event that we'll talk about in a second. Ben, you, but can you talk about the work on that commission? I, I, I'd uh, be delighted. It was a really uh, interesting uh, group of people. Herb Kelleher, uh, who founded Southwest, was on the uh, committee, Bob Crandall, Fred Smith, uh, and others who uh, you've certainly heard of. Uh, and in addition, uh, there was a guy there, I'd never met anybody with three first names, but uh, alphabetically, we were seated alphabetically, and the guy to my right was a guy named John Peter Paul, who at that time was head of the International Association of Machinists. And uh, during the, uh, the, com the uh, commission was at work very active for almost a year, the meetings were generally over a period of two years, so we had lunch and uh, dinner, and we got very, very well acquainted, uh, and we were able to share issues with respect to our own industry. Uh, so I was very, very pleased at the uh, conclusion when we put our report. Uh, Jerry Belisles had been was the chairman, who'd been the uh, uh, governor of Virginia, really, uh, really nice guy, and included in a long list of recommendations with respect to the airlines was a recommendation that we uh, put some sort of limits on product liability for uh, general aviation. And that led again to our, uh, it was a great help for the, uh, uh, our efforts in 1994, which I'd be glad to cover as well. And there were some pretty amazing personalities on the commission a, a, as well that you were working on. Herb Kelleher, you know, very shy, uh, <laughs> introverted person on, uh, yeah, those of us that have met him. Uh, just the opposite, and, and Mr. Crandall, and, and so you, you started building allies. And, uh, and then we move, move into GARA, probably one of the, m the most seminal events for this industry uh, in, in GAMA's first 50 years. Um, you had to go against uh, uh, probably some of the most powerful uh, lobbying groups in the world, which are the trial lawyers. To be able to go ahead and get, you know, we, we're always talking about tort reform, and uh, and obviously the the impact of uh, lawsuits against this industry and, and what it had done. Can you can if you call up the picture, Christine, um, you know, here here you're in the Oval Office uh, signing ceremony for for Gera. You got uh, 
uh, very young Vice President Gore standing behind you, Nancy Castlebaum uh, next to you, Phil Boyer's in the picture, a lot of folks uh, that we know. I understand you got the pen uh, that, that signed Gera, but boy, what a massive effort. You had to make certain commitments about what you would do at Cessna. Can you just talk about how you pulled off the General Aviation Revitalization Act? Well, uh, for, for, first of all, it was a uh, it was a, an amazingly effective uh, team effort. If you look back to 1986, I think probably the toughest decision I ever made at Cessna was the decision to stop producing propeller aircraft because we simply could not handle and project the cost of product liability. We were being sued by the trial lawyers in literally every accident and, and uh, regardless of the cause. So the industry stopped building. Uh, single-engine propeller aircraft pretty much across the board in 1986. 1987, Gamma said, let's see if we can somehow or other uh, limit the uh, product liability program. We introduced a bill which was a little bit overly complicated, uh, I think, and we continued to do that for several years. And by 1994, we realized that we had an opportunity. We had Bob Dole was the majority leader. Nancy Kassebaum was uh, chairman of the Subcommittee on Aviation, the Commerce Committee. John McCain was on that committee. Dan Glickman was a, a very, very successful Democratic congressman from uh, Kansas uh, with a, a very, very close relationship with uh, Clinton. Uh, we knew that the country uh, needed jobs. Uh, 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 Ed, Ed and I always wish we had written a book about this because it's the only time in history that the product liability laws have been, uh, have been uh, changed. It was a very complicated uh, process. We had to appear before uh, both the Judiciary Committees in the House and Senate and the respective Commerce Committees. We uh, had 300 and some co-sponsors in the House, uh, more than 60 in the Senate, but we could not get a uh, hearing from uh, a guy named Jack Brooks, who was uh, uh, out of West Texas, chairman of the Ju Judiciary Committee. And the, the really critical player among all of those people who were involved in the program was Dan Glickman, because we met with uh, Tom Foley, who was Speaker of the House at that point in time, uh, Ed and I and uh, Dan, and Dan said he was going to introduce a discharge petition in the House to avoid the requirement of going uh, through the judiciary. And uh, Tom Foley uh, begged him not to do it. And Dan said, you know, Tom, my district is hurting. We used to have 25,000 jobs, and now we have a fraction of that in the industry. So he filed the discharge petition and uh, and got so many signatures that Jack Brooks agreed to have the hearing. Uh, we had the hearing with the Ju Judiciary Committee. We got great help, by the way, during those uh, hearings from a guy named John Goglia, who was uh, with the uh, International Association of Machinists. One of the, one of the highlights uh, of those four hearings, uh, John and I were testifying before Jack Brooks, and uh, Jack turned to uh, John Goglia and said, why in the world uh, uh, do, you, do you want to uh, limit uh, product liability? And John, big Ken Piscani slammed his uh, fist on the table and looked up at Jack Brooks and he says, because we want our jobs back. And uh, miraculously, uh, the uh, uh, legislation was signed and whatever that date was in August when that picture was taken, Bill Clinton looked up at the group before he signed it and he said, the reason that I'm signing this bill is because I know it will create a lot of jobs. He was right. It did, and I think uh, truly uh, Gara was one of the amazing accomplishments uh, led by uh, Gamma, and we should really be proud of what we did. Well, and I understand in that process that we had a very able staffer working for Nancy Kassebaum by the name of Ed Bolin that, uh, that helped quite a bit during that time. And uh, it turned out pretty good for Ed because uh, he got hired off the hill after that, didn't he? Good old Ed. Ed and I worked together from the time he joined uh, uh, Nancy Kassebaum's staff after law school. He's a good old KU guy, so we root hard for the uh, Jayhawks. But uh, between Ed Bolin, Ed Stimson, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a really key group of uh, committed people, uh, it was a very, very, very uh, meaningful, satisfying program. Well, Michael... Uh 
mentioned the the uh, Wright Brothers uh, Trophy, which is always you know going going to that each year is just it's phenomenal the people that that we have up on stage. And if you if you look at the night that uh, that you got the trophy in 1995, the room was packed. And uh, back then uh, we had some pretty high level people uh, coming up on stage. You go to the next slide. Uh, and and you look at this picture of you up on stage being given the award. You got two senators, Senator Kasselbaum on on our far right, and you, then Senator Dole, and uh, the head of the NAA, and then Dan Glickman, who by that time was the Secretary of Agriculture. So a big, powerful group. And if you go to the next slide, you can tell that uh, as you got that trophy, you were one one uh, happy guy. But you earned that. And um, and the citation is, is a real powerful one, and um, I'm I'm going to take the second to to just read uh, one of the things that that is in that. Uh, the citation uh, says for leadership in the revitalization of general aviation, effective public service, and active involvement in the creation and support of innovative aviation-related programs, and opportunities for the disadvantaged and disabled. Can, can you tell us how that night was? Uh, I re remember, remember that uh, night like it was uh, yesterday. It was a wonderful honor. My old pal, uh, Arnold Palmer, was part of the uh, presentation. John McCain was at the head table. Of course, Nancy and Bob and uh, uh, Dan were uh, uh, great longtime friends. My entire family was there, and uh, it was a, uh, uh, a wonderful a uh, uh, wonderful evening and uh, for me and in and, and my view for the industry. Well, one of the things that was alluded to in the citation and, and talked about um, was it, it talked about a welfare to work program, as Michael said, that President Clinton uh, acknowledged as one of the finest examples uh, that he had seen uh, during his presidency uh, of corporate responsibility uh, to the community. Can you talk about that program? Uh, Pete, I'd, I'd be glad to. We, we uh, realized in the, uh, in the late, in the mid to late 80s uh, that there was really a uh, major requirement to train people who needed a job. It's one thing when someone's on welfare for somebody to say, well, go get a job, and it's another if you're not qualified to get that job. So not really knowing exactly what we were going to do, but we did want to help. In 1989, we bought a uh, deserted uh, grocery store in the northeast part of Wichita, which is a, in a high, uh, low-income area, and partnered with the city uh, and uh, 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 selected uh, 15 people in our first class, first graduating class was 15 ladies, they were all single parents. They had 38 children, I think, as I remember. They were eager to learn. Uh, we had volunteers from Cessna who uh, trained them. Uh, they had to learn to come to work every day, and they had to learn to uh, be uh, sheet metal workers. It was a period that lasted about four or five months, and we didn't push anybody. But of those 14, first uh, 15 ladies, 13 of them uh, were still with us uh, five years later. We got a little bit. Uh, we got a little bit smarter with each class, and from 1989 until I retired in 2005, I think we graduated 72 or 73 classes, something like 1,500 people, uh, men and women. Uh, a very, very high percentage of them uh, uh, stayed with the company, and more importantly, they were able to raise their families and participate in our insurance programs. And the real secret of that program was the day they were selected and came to the training center, they were effectively employees of uh, Cessna. They were very proud of their badge because they knew when they finished they had a job. Uh, we expanded the program in 1994 uh, uh, with a much larger learning center. And in 1996, we built a sub-assembly facility in that area because many of these people did not have automobiles. And we're very pleased that... Uh, President Clinton uh, came out and uh, helped us uh, uh, open and uh, celebrate that new facility. Well, what a tremendous accomplishment. Well, of course, you didn't stop there. Um, we, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Christine, uh, I've got a picture of you here on uh, doing, doing what you did very well with uh, another former Gamma chairman, Brian Behrens. 
uh, and Ed Stimson, uh, and uh, you were able to work for our industry to be able to get bonus depreciation. And it's just uh, amazing that uh, I think this is one of the, the last years that we can do it at 100%. So it's, it's lasted for a long time, and now it's going to start uh, being decreased. But it, I can't tell you how many craft sales that that, uh, that has generated. So can you talk about uh, that work on being able to get bonus depreciation extended to our industry? You know, this goes back a little bit, uh, Pete. In the 1980s, <clears throat> we... Uh, benefited greatly from the investment tax credit, as did others who were uh, selling uh, 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 capital products. Uh, when the investment tax credit expired, I can't remember exactly uh, what year that was, uh, we were able to get at least an accelerated depreciation schedule, as you remember. It was a straight-line depreciation over five years. And uh, uh, as we entered, I can't remember exactly what year, 2000s, uh, we realize and uh, the importance of it, as did members of Congress and members of the Finance Committee in both the House and Senate. And the next step was to uh, accelerate that process uh, to get a higher percentage in the first year. And then we were successful in, in achieving bonus depreciation, which, as you know, enables you to write off in year one. As part of the recent uh, CARES Act, that uh, uh, bonus depreciation has been extended through, I think it's 2022, and uh, uh, particularly uh, today and in the next uh, year or two as this industry grows and, in fact, will benefit from uh, a uh, terrible pandemic, more and more people, I believe, will be using our products, and the uh, bonus depreciation will be a major part of that uh, marketing effort. Well... If you call up the next slide, you know, you mentioned you retire in 2005, but you weren't done. Uh, in 2008, uh, I, re I remember distinctly being at the NBA base uh, convention there and walking the floor as the stock market is crashing and everybody's just shaking their head knowing that we're going to go into a big-time recession. Uh, and it happened fast. And then just a few short months later, uh, with a new uh, Congress in place, the auto execs come to Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden our industry has just this gigantic target on our back. Uh, I got together with Ed Bolin, and we said, uh, what can we do? And we came up with the idea, let's revive the No Plane, No Gain program. We do what we often do is we said, okay, you take this, this approach, we'll take this approach, we'll do it coordinated. And, uh, and one of the things that Ed did then is came to you and said, we got to get some celebrities to be able to talk about this industry and the importance of it. And, of course, he came to you because you knew who we, who we could go after. And I understand that uh, your friend, Arnold Palmer, uh, you've been longtime friends, um, you called him, and he, he that was a fairly easy sell uh, through your friendship and his passion for aviation. But then you called Neil Armstrong, and uh, I, the report I got is that uh, Neil said he, he gets offered seven or eight figures to be able to endorse a product, and he never does that because he was a very private private person. And uh, you told him, well, you're not going to get a cent, and you were able to get him on board. And then through through that effort and, and your personality, Ed was able to, to also enlist Warren Buffett. Can you talk about those those personalities and, and your friendships with, with especially with Arnie and and with Neil and uh, and how you're able to get them to support our industry. Uh, you bet, Pete. We we, we uh, you and Ed and I and others r really felt that we needed not 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 just celebrities but uh, well known, highly respected people who who did have a commitment or an involvement in uh, aviation. And of course, Arnie was uh, easy. Uh, Arnie and I have been friends for uh, 50 years, and he would help uh, the industry any time we ask him. So we, we said, let's see if we can get Arnie and, uh, and Warren and, uh, and uh, Neil. So uh, Arnie, Arnie was the first call, and, of course, he agreed a uh, second call. Actually, when I flew up to see uh, Warren Buffett, I'd met uh, Warren Buffett on the golf course. Uh, in uh, in the early 90s, and we became uh, friends. And then when he acquired Flight Safety and then acquired NetJets, he was obviously uh, a member of our industry, uh, uh, both uh, uh, <laughs> uh, philosophically
philosophically and uh, financially. So uh, I explained to him what our goal was, uh, that we'd had Arnie, that he was going to be a participant, and he was uh, willing to participate. Both of them were, we did the taping and so forth in La Trobe and in uh, Omaha. The tough one was uh, Neil. Uh, I'd known Neil since 1974. He'd been chairman of our Citation Chairs program, uh, and uh, we had tons of mutual friends in Cincinnati, so I flew up to see Neil after we had the others. And uh, he was very, very reticent. He said, uh, is there any way we can do this without, without a picture of me or uh, something like that? Well, we, uh, we got a chuckle out of that. But in any event, we ultimately convinced him to uh, uh, participate. And uh, one of our more uh, creative uh, young people who did a lot of work, yeah, a guy named Gray Hobson came up with the uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, first, obviously, uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, four, obviously, Arnold Palmer, and most, uh, Warren Buffett. And when we uh, we flew Neil out to the uh, NBAA convention at NBAA in, in the 2008 or 2009, there was this huge, enormous banner on the side of the uh, uh, convention center with Neil's uh, picture and Warren's and Arnold. And, uh, and uh, it, Neil was uh, uh, certainly... Uh, uh, not not upset, except that he said, wow, you never told me my picture was going to be up on the uh, side of the convention center, but they couldn't have been better uh, to work with. I think uh, you'd agree it was a very, very successful part of an overall program to just convince people that our industry was a solid, uh, effective, necessary part of the air transportation system, and uh, that was a good program to, uh, to uh, educate people about it. Well, and it was just one year later, you told me that a very, very important event for you, uh, if you bring up the next picture, Christine, is uh, when a uh, FAA administrator named Radney Babbitt, who was at, the, uh, at Ed's keynote address at NBA in 2010, he, he gave his speech, and the first thing he started off with is, I get to be up here with Arnold Palmer as a, as a line guy. I got to refuel his airplane, and that was the coolest thing I ever did, and that was the start of a very long career for Randy. But uh, at the end of, of his talk, and, and he, he brought a pretty distinguished group of folks up on the stage to be able to give a, that Master Pilot Award for 50 years uh, of uh, accident-free and, and dedicated service to aviation as pilots. And you look at that stage, you got the first man that walked on the moon, you got the last man to step off the moon, Gene Cernan. You got Clay Lacey, who's probably got more uh, flight time than the angel Gabriel in there. You, and then, of course, uh, arguably the most famous golf personality in the world and the FAA administrator. That must have been uh, quite a feeling up on stage. Can you, can you tell us about that? Well, that, that, was, uh, that was fun. My first uh, response was, what am I doing up here with uh, this group of uh, uh, highly... Uh, uh, impressive aviators, but it was uh, uh, having flown uh, uh, for more than 50 years uh, professionally and uh, always uh, with great enthusiasm uh, for an aviator to be there with those guys was, uh, was uh, indescribably uh, special. It was fun. Well, I, I could just continue this on for hours. I, I love talking, talking to you. I know that that I can speak for my buddy Ed Bowen. You've been a tremendous mentor for us, and I can think of no one better to to exemplify our, our Gamma's first 50 years as uh, a three-time chairman, but somebody that's just done so much for the for the industry. So I'm going to turn it over to you for for whatever perspectives you'd like to pass to uh, to everybody, Russ. Uh, Pete, and uh, to all of you, this is an un. un uh, Familiar setting for me to be at a, a virtual meeting, but it's a great honor to be here. I appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, especially important to review so many things that we've done at Gamma over the years, uh, many of which we've covered, a few others that we haven't covered. Uh, user fees was a, were a major issue that we were uh, successful in retaining. Uh, <clears throat> I have no doubt that if it hadn't been for Gamma and NBAA, uh, during a really intensive battle over, uh, over several years recently. Uh, the airlines would have been successful in privatizing the air traffic control system. Fortunately, 
once again, we were uh, we were successful in uh, doing that. Of course, uh, Gara is uh, off the top. There had never been uh, product liability uh, reform before. We delivered what we promised uh, over those last uh, uh, 26 years since that bill was passed. We have no doubt uh, created literally millions of jobs, re-energized uh, uh, the uh, industry. So. Uh, we have had terrific leadership at uh, uh, Gamma with uh, Ed Stimson and Ed Boland and Pete uh, Bunce. Uh, that's a pretty impressive uh, lineup. Uh, we've had great participation from uh, our board, which has uh, started. Uh, we could have our meetings in a small room, and today we're having them in a somewhat larger uh, environment because we need to continue uh, that growth. So uh, I would say... Uh, Again, uh, let's celebrate uh, with great enthusiasm the heritage that we have created during the first 50 years, and uh, let's work together to take this industry to an even higher level during the next 50 years. Thank you again. Thank you, Russ. Outstanding. <laughs> the, before Russ departs, Mr. Chairman, any words? Yeah, Russ, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. You've made some obviously very tremendous contributions to business and general aviation. It's an honor to, to uh, be spending time with you. I think everybody on this uh, this call and in the boardroom would would agree with that. Uh, you, you've done so much for our industry. We can't thank you enough, especially uh, three Gamma chairmanships. I'm just completing my first year as Gamma chairmanships, and I can't imagine three. So that's it's a, you've got some endurance there. Congratulations. And, and your memory, by the way, is fantastic. So thank you very much for all you've done for, for our industry. People I appreciate like myself it. Thank you. Thank you. What you've done. 